Um, our two speakers are uh, Jenny Formby, who is pre as previously General Secretary of the Labour Party, was in the hottest seat anybody could ever have. And Howard Beckett, uh, Assistant General Secretary of Unite, uh, an, an NEC member, uh, on one of the outspoken NEC members on the left uh, of the uh, Labour Party. Um, he's, still in, he's still in a very, very hot seat. Um, obviously, uh, every, every, every time he goes to one of the meetings. Now, we've only got an hour altogether, and we've had a very large number of questions over a huge range of things. Um, and we were, I doubt whether we'll be able to take them all uh, in, in barely 40 minutes. Um, I expect our two speakers to take in their introductory remarks, and I expect Jenny will be going first, um, no more than 20 minutes between them in their opening. When we move on to questions, it's entirely up to them uh, if one of them just wants to field them and do more of the work, that's, I take it, that they've got agreement amongst themselves how to handle the questions, and that's entirely up, entirely up to our speakers. Um, so, um, what uh, I propose uh, to start off with, I mean, given that overwhelmingly... Uh, or the great majority of people in this uh, audience are members of the Labour Party, um, then quite a few questions relate to aspects of Labour Party and its policies. Um, and I'm, I'm going to put forward a group of five questions uh, when we actually get to the questions. But first of all, before we get there, it's over to Jenny to give her introductory remarks. Thanks very much, Stuart. And hi, everyone. And thank you so much for inviting me to speak this evening. It's really great to see you all. And I really appreciate the invitation. Um, I'm not sure if, if Howard's made it on yet. He's trying to get off another meeting. He's incredibly busy. He's got about three meetings back to back tonight. So he's going to be with us as soon as he can. Um, and thank you very much, Stuart, for that introduction. I have to say, I think the hottest seat was probably held by Jeremy rather than me. Um, but they were all pretty warm, I have to say. Um, but let's face it, we're meeting at what is clearly a really difficult time for the Labour, labour movement, and frankly, for most people in the UK. Um, we've got thousands of people suffering extreme hardship as a result of the pandemic. So many have lost their jobs, especially those in insecure or part-time work, like the millions in hospitality and leisure. Others are on furlough with reduced earnings. And there's many who are simply laid off with nothing because they don't know their rights. They're not in a trade union. They're not quite sure how to get into a trade union or try to their rights. So there's huge numbers of people suffering major, major hardship financially and otherwise as well. And then we've got the countless thousands of essential workers who've worked selflessly and tirelessly throughout the pandemic. So many of them have lost co colleagues to COVID, whether they're NHS or care workers or they're other essential workers like bus drivers, refuse collectors, all those people who keep our society and our communities working. So we're facing massive uncertainty about how we rebuild our economy after the pandemic. And also something, you know, we're probably not talking about enough, how we meet the challenges that are facing us um, after um, Brexit has, has um, hit us, which is of course threatening huge numbers of jobs in manufacturing and, and in other areas as well. So what's our Tory government doing throughout all of this? Well, surprise, surprise, they're doing what they always do. They're ruthlessly attacking workers' rights and civil liberties at every opportunity. And I'd just like to say how fantastic it is seeing so many people getting involved in the kill the bill process, um, protest. Uh, you know, it's, it's really heartening to see that. They're, they're happening all over the country. And I was really pleased to go to one in Southampton last week. Um, but they're still doing everything they can to squash that and to attack us. They're continuing to inflict huge cuts to essential services and absolutely heartlessly and disgracefully refusing to give public sector workers the pay rise they deserve. But at the same time, they're corruptly lining the pockets of their mates in big business or the landlords down the local pub, whichever way you like to look at it, by awarding contracts worth billions with no proper oversight or accountability to anyone. 
Now, I'm not going to say too much about the Labour Party um, and where it is at the moment, because although, I, of course, I share a number of the concerns that other people have expressed, since stepping down as General Secretary, I haven't attacked either Keir or my successor as General Secretary, because I experienced firsthand just how damaging the relentless attacks were on Jeremy to the party and to all of us. But it's never been more important to have strong opposition. An opposition that will take the fight to the Tories, that will win the confidence of all of our communities, wherever they may be, that they've got someone on their side. Um, and I'm really not sure we're in the right place at all where that's concerned. What I will say is that the problems facing the left, both in the party and the wider Labour movement are significant. And for me, the best way that I'm finding to contribute is to focus my activism at the moment within my trade union. Um, as well as being a member of the Labour Party for over 40 years, I've also been a member of Unite and its predecessor union for the same length of time. And I've been a huge supporter of the way in which Len McCluskey has led our union since he was elected as General Secretary. He's given fantastic industrial and political leadership for our members. Um, and he's been one of the few General Secretaries who's been willing to challenge the Labour Party when needed instead of giving uncritical support, as is the case, unfortunately, with far too many. But now he's standing down and the Special Executive Council call for next week, so we're certainly going to kick off the election for his replacement within days. So it's crucial that Unite elect someone who can build on Len's legacy and take Unite to the next level, both in the workplace, but also really importantly in the political arena. And I'm really open about the fact that I think the best person to lead, lead Unite in the future is Howard Beckett, and I'm proud to be helping to lead his campaign to become General Secretary. Our mo movement needs strong and fearless leadership. We need leaders who aren't only experienced and who share our values, but who are bold, who are inclusive, who believe in member-led grassroots organisation winning for all of us. In my view, Howard Beckett's a brilliant leader and that's why his election is so important to me. But I'm not gonna say too much more about that because I think it's really important that you hear from Howard himself. But I genuinely believe that the election for the General Secretary of Unite is really crucially important for the left and for the Labour movement in general. But I just want to say one thing in particular. One thing that's always given me hope over all my years of activism, both in my trade union and in the Labour Party, is our members. Members like you buoyed me up during what were two very difficult years when I was General Secretary. You've campaigned, you've protested, you've organised, you've made a real difference, and you've kept hope alive for people. The hundreds of thousands of people, especially young people and women, who joined the party because they were inspired by Jeremy Corbyn's message of hope, they're still there. And it's up to all of us to feed that hope, to show them we've got something worth fighting for and to give them confidence that collectively we can win. So I'm gonna stop now because Stuart did ask us to be fairly brief, but I just wanna thank you for everything you do and to say never give up. And thanks again so much for inviting me. All right, thanks very much, Jenny. Uh, we'll move straight over to Howard. I hope he's unmuted. I think I am sure. Yes. Thank you very much for inviting me. And listen, first of all, if I can put on record my thanks to Jenny. She has been outspoken in respect of her support for me for General Secretary, and I, I am extraordinarily grateful for it and humbled. But uh, Jenny's work in the Labour Party, I think all of us know the bravery uh, that she showed during that time as General Secretary. I remember we had a conversation right at the outset when Jenny was getting the role and it should have been one of absolute and utter privilege, but she knew at the start that she was leaving the job that she loved working for the trade union, uh, doing things at the front line for members. She was leaving that job that she loved because there was a bigger picture in respect of trying to deliver a Labour Party uh, into number 10. And she took the job on with a gusto. Uh, she never flinched from it. She worked her, her way through with tremendous health problems, still being attacked. Uh, by those on the right of the party and never once did she show anything other than confidence, dignity and ability and empathy towards members and she really is to be congratulated for that. You're a standout Jenny so thank you very much for all that you did your time as General Secretary but thank you even more for the work that you did whenever you were an officer of the Unite and before that the Transport and General Workers Union. And uh, Stuart, where do you start in respect of this? Obviously, we're coming through COVID now. We all hope that the end of this second wave is the end of it. And I've seen the questions that people have put in beforehand to you, and I don't want to stop uh, at any opportunity for people to ask questions. They're incredibly interesting and deep questions that people have put forward, and they deserve uh, the full time from Jenny and myself in respect of answering them. But nevertheless, we are 
facing a moment where we're coming out of COVID and we have to at this time challenge ourselves as to whether or not the trade union movement is going to own the narrative coming out of COVID or whether or not it will once again be the establishment. And I say once again, because whenever we came through the first wave, I certainly was one who hoped that working class people would step up and make sure that we talk for a new society in the way that I feel that many people did during the first wave. I've referenced on many Zooms the fact that in 1946, when people returned from the Second World War, they had no concept in the late 30s of a society with a social state or an NHS or their children going to third tier education, but they simply refused to accept anything less. And at that stage, debt as a percentage of GDP was at three times the level it is now, but they demanded a society that delivered for them because they had stood up for liberty, they had fought a world war for liberty, and they weren't about to accept anything less and put their elbows to the ground to create that social state, the NHS, children to third tier education, built a million council houses, and maybe somewhat naively or optimistically, if you like, because I am an optimist, I felt coming out of the first wave, whenever we had showed such solidarity for frontline workers, that we would own the narrative going forward and we would accept nothing other than a fundamental change of society, nothing other than more equality and fairness, nothing other than a fair day's wage for a fair day's work. But I felt very quickly that we lost that narrative, that we lost the argument with the media as to whether or not there would be a change in the future or whether or not we would go back uh, to the old ways, whether or not tomorrow would be better than our yesterdays, as I put it. And I feel once again that we have that challenge now coming out of the second wave. Can we win the narrative as to what society do we have? There is 150,000 plus people who have died in this country during COVID. There will be some on the Zoom who have worked their way through COVID and been petrified uh, at various stages as to whether or not they would contract the virus in their workplace and take it home. There has been 77,000 plus prosecutions of individuals for individuals' breaches of the regulations, the COVID Act regulations. But at the same time, there's been 134,000 complaints to the HSE about unsafe workplaces and not one single prosecution of an employer for placing workers into unsafe workplaces. And this is what we have. We have a death rate of all of the countries with a population of over 20 million people. We have the highest death rate in the world. We have a government that refused to take on board any theories in respect of zero COVID, theories that were not only necessary for saving lives, but obviously then necessary for rebuilding an economy, but fundamentally a government that placed people's lives against the economy and never really understood the basic principle of the fact that the economy exists for people and not vice versa. And we have a front bench that frankly let us down, has not been able to narrate this. And this is the reason why we have such an important role in society right now. Why us, the union, have to make the fight? Unite during COVID has shut countless workplaces as a result of them being unsafe. We took the action. In the first wave, we shut 13 food uh, factories, and that was a sector that Jenny is very familiar with. She was a national officer for the sector. We shut 13 meat factories in the first two weeks of COVID because they were unsafe and the employer was refusing uh, to make them safe. We're, through COVID, we have fought for people's right to picket. We have had two disputes, one at Optar in Leeds, where we took South Yorkshire Police and the, and the government to court, and a similar one in Seiko in Scotland, where we similarly had to take the Scottish government to court, where workers were being forced into work, told their work was essential, told that their workplace was safe, but when they have lawful ballot to change their terms and conditions to be actually paid, for the work that they were doing, they were told that a picket outside of their workplace was unsafe because of COVID and the police moved them on. And it was only Unite stepping in that made uh, that confirmed that right to take lawful industrial action through the COVID regulations. And coming out of COVID now, we have fire and rehire. So this is probably the worst of industrial practices that I can recall seeing in such a pandemic scale uh, in the time that I've been working in the trade union and previously the practice where people 
were forced into work during COVID, told their work was essential. There are horrendous examples of this up and down the country. This obviously started with British Airways, where 42,000 of our members were dismissed, with 30,000 to be re-employed and dramatically reduced terms and conditions, but then has been a domino effect into every sector in our nations and into every nation itself, to the extent where we have an example, not a Unite dispute, a Unison dispute, but Heartlands Hospital in the West Midlands, where porters worked their way through the pandemic, lost their lives, lost the lives of colleagues through the pandemic. And then whenever it was over, immediately they were hit with a new contract that would mean that they literally sleep to work. Their rotors changed to the extent that they sleep to work. The countless examples that I can give you for Unite that we have going on at the moment, we have Good Lords are down in London at the moment. I, I visited an engineering factory in, uh, in Leicester last week, where, again, they had lost a colleague through COVID, a 37-year-old year old Polish man who had left two children and a wife, died through COVID. They were forced into work, told her again that their work was essential and immediately issued with new contracts. Why? because the employer can do it. Suddenly has realized that they can do it and realizes that our ability to have industrial action is limited at the moment because of the reality of the situation that our members face. But Unite is taking that industrial action and that's why we now have a Unite fund, a dispute fund of 40 million pounds with strike pay up to 70 pounds a day because we know the challenge that we face to make sure that it is not workers who pay for this crisis, but in fact that it is wealth to pay for this crisis. We have free ports, and I see Jamie Jiskell on the on the on the call. It's great to see you, Jamie, and the work that you're doing up there. It's obviously. As, uh, as mayor is absolutely phenomenal and we congratulate you but Jamie obviously knows the reality of the risks of free ports and there's a question in respect of free ports and nobody should be in any doubt that this is about the Tories moving to deregulation the agenda here is to limit the influence of trade unions and ultimately to drive down wages to individualize the workplace and make sure that the collective voice is no longer heard with the knowledge as to how that then impacts in the political arena. We have the disgraceful CHIS legislation that has gone through the House of Commons during this crisis where now it is lawful for the government to legalize crime before it is committed. It is lawful for them to say to the agents of the state that you can commit murder, rape, or torture if it is in the name of the state, to encourage agent provocateurs to go into organizations and criminalize those organizations. And nobody should be in any doubt that that affects the trade union movement. Any unlawful action or any action that's taken outside of a lawful industrial balance will immediately give the excuse that the government needs to put agent provocateurs into trade unions and legalise crime that would then be committed in the name of the trade unions and then the trade unions would be declared a criminal organisation and if anyone thinks that that is some Orwellian hyperbole. We only need to listen to Norman Tebbett in the Houses of Parliament two weeks ago, where he talked about special branch briefing him on the holidays of senior trade unionists and talked about corrupt trade unionists visiting him to give him the agendas of their own trade unions. And then extraordinarily, we have the police sentencing and crime legislation, which is a piece of legislation that is probably as bad as any that I've seen in the last 20 years, legislation that looks to criminalize the Romanian traveler community, legislation that clearly says that the right of protest will now be limited. If your protest is too noisy, or if you have not agreed start and finishes times with the police, or if the police do not like your route, or if you ought to have known of concerns, ought to have known of concerns that the police have, then you are potentially guilty of a criminal offense and potential for a jail sentence. And the extraordinary reaction that we've had to Black Lives Matters, where you will face 10 years in jail if you so much as put it, vandalize a monument of a racist. So the, everyone has made the comparisons about the jail sentence for rape as compared to the jail sentence for damaging a racist monument. And we asked the question, is sexism and racism institutionalized in society? Well, look at a piece of legislation that has presently been passed by parliament that has institutional sexism and racism at its very core, and you get the answer that you need. And then Jenny has referenced the fact that she is not going to criticize uh, Labour, and I can understand that, but I am. The reality in respect of this is that Labour has been want uh, has been found wanting during this crisis. It has not put up 
an alternative agenda. It is not advocated for zero COVID, even though we know of the examples where zero COVID has worked around the world. It has not been critical of government ministers. It has not called for resignations where resignations should have happened. And it has an, an internalized battle at a time whenever we needed champions for the working class and we needed champions who were putting themselves at the forefront and risking their very lives to keep this nation going. And there is no identity for Labour. There is no identity of socialism that gives people a vision as to what a society looks like. There is no connection with the trade union movement and there is no hope being presented to a generation who desperately need hope right now. Jenny referenced and correctly so what we achieved in 2017, but how quickly have they dismantled what we achieved in 2017 and rode the calendar back to 2007 and 2008. And that's why the role of Unite is so vital now in society. We have to present a society that is different. We have to say that politics exists in your workplaces and in your communities, not just in Westminster. We have to find the champions of industry and the champions of community to go out and voice an alternative society. And we have to refuse to listen to the message of the media that wants us to be inward looking and wants us to believe in their lies and their misconceptions about whether or not we can deliver a new society going forward. So I'll finish Stuart, by saying this, that I have optimism for the future. I believe that people do want a different tomorrow than yesterday. And I believe in young people will step in forward to own their own lives, but never has it been more so important for the trade unions now to come together. And never has it been more important for Unite to play that leading role, not just to keep Unite on the left of society, not just just to reject the narrative that Unite is too involved in politics and not enough in industrial, or Unite is too involved with community members and not enough with industrial members, but to say that Unite is big enough and important enough to play a role in society that is involved in absolutely everything, in politics, in industry, in community, and linking all of, all of those together and that we are doing it through modern media and that we do not have to listen to mainstream media any longer because our message of socialism and trade unionism gets out to our members through our owning our own media channels and not be reliant on anyone else delivering our message. That's what will deliver hope for the next generation. That's what will make people believe in collectivism and trade unionism. And ultimately, that is what will change the society that we live in. Thank you, Stuart. Right. Well, thanks very much, Howard. Uh, now the meeting gets an awful lot tougher for you in particular, because you've got two challenges. One is to ask, uh, answer a, a stream of questions. The, the, the opening question is in five parts. Um, and the challenge to you is to be able to answer them effectively in a fairly brief period of time so we can go on to the next tough question. Uh, it's a bit like the uh, Grand National with the, 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 the fences getting higher and higher. Anyway, so uh, I'll start off um, and Trish Williams may not, uh, may not be here in, uh, in person, uh, but uh, she has, still has a question. And that is, she, and I'm going through all five. She's ask, asking what is happening with the 50 people who are still outstanding in terms of the suspensions in the latest uh, warfare against constituency officers, Derek Marsh wants to know whether open selections would help to alter the horrible culture within the Parliamentary Labour Party and many groups of Labour councillors Linda Hoffman asks a similar question, whether the toxic culture on the NEC and at Labour Party head office, has it got better or worse since Keir Starmer was elected leader? Andy Walker wonders why, when we had the chance under Jeremy Corbyn to really democratise the party, we very largely failed to use that opportunity. And lastly, from Jamie Driscoll, under present circumstances, how can there be any unity 
between left and right in the party and how can the left develop its own unity recognizing that divided parties always lose elections Stuart, I, I like I, I don't know if Jenny wants to chip in with anything in reference to this. And some of it, I'm sure she she has very strong views on. Uh, listen, let me try and rattle through them. In respect of it, 50 people suspended. I wish it was still 50, as I understand it. It's a figure. It's closer to 60. Obviously, Unite has stepped forward in respect of the legal representation for members, and the executive made that decision. And I personally have been meeting on a regular occasion with solicitors for Momentum, who are also representing uh, people who are suspended, and also uh, uh, Bindman solicitors who are representing uh, JVL, who also have people suspended and have tried to coordinate the actions that people are, are taking. And I recently met with SOS to start cataloguing uh, the offences. It's a truism that what Labour is now doing is moving to suspension as the go-to response to any complaint that they receive, and obviously politicising uh, glue as a consequence of it, and it is wrong. I've been uh, very clear and upfront with uh, with everybody, including the NEC, including the officers of Labour, as to how atrocious this practice is. But unfortunately, it's one that we have to work our way through. I don't think it's a tactic of the Labour Party that has any longevity. I suspect that they have built something here that they themselves are struggling to deal with. I think they cannot deal themselves with the caseload that they've created as a consequence. And I think, and I'll come on to Jamie's question uh, in, a, in a bit, I think that ultimately what they've done is that they will be uh, the architects of true left unity because of the way that they have conducted themselves through this. But we will continue to work through this and we will continue to make sure that nobody is left behind. And I'll, I'll, referen I'll stop the answer there because I reference it again, Stuart, later on about uh, what are we doing to um, to create this left unity. On open selections, I personally am an advocate for open selections. There's two questions that are related there, open sec uh, selections and democratising the party. I spoke within the union in favour of open selections whenever it was mooted. Uh, but I think what people need to understand, and I think Jenny would confirm this, is that the paper, the Open Democracy, that ultimately went to conference was Jeremy Corbyn's paper. It was a paper that Jeremy Corbyn wanted to back. It was the reason why I say to those here in the CLPs and uh, I, as well as the, obviously those in the left unions that what went so horribly wrong at that conference should never have happened because it was not the left unions who were deciding to back um, the, the open democracy paper. It was Jeremy Corbyn who wanted to back it and the left unions had committed to always backing Jeremy Corbyn. But I personally am in, in favour of open selections. I believe that until such time as that we have a PLP that is truly representative of us, ourselves, that we will always find ourselves walking into this disunity between left and right, because ultimately the PLP does not look like a Labour Party that anyone in this Zoom would want to see. It looks like a party of what it is, with many people who have never worked in their lives, careerists who are then flowing into seats and flowing into seats on the premise that they, their politics is not politics of socialism. And we have to create a Labour Party that is very different and open democracy is part of that. But no one should be in any doubt that what was put in Jeremy's paper and open democracy on triggers was very close to open selections, yet it was not used. It wasn't used in the last election. Now, part of that was because the last election came upon us quickly and people didn't know how to trigger it, but also part of it was the fact that we hadn't really built the CLPs where we had the we had the weight on the ground to move these triggers as quickly as we uh, should have. And what's going on right now in the Labour Party is ultimately to designed to destroy that opportunity of democracy. Because if the makeup of the CLPs changes, if the makeups of the officers change, then we will have no chance with open democracy, and we'll have no chance uh, with with open selections so we have to that's why we must stay and fight in respect of this because this is now a fight an existential fight for the labor party itself and what direction will the labor party go into unfortunately the nec and head office is more toxic under the leadership of Jer of uh, keir starmer than it ever was under the leadership of 
uh, of um, Jeremy Corbyn. And I can say categorically that I know that the leadership of Jeremy Corbyn and Jenny Formby made every effort to avoid these types of d- divisions, made every effort to walk that line and make sure that Labour was considered an open church. And some on the left were critical of those de- of those decisions. Some people were openly critical of the of the appeasement, as they saw it, of the right wing. But the reality was that Jeremy did not want to see a party that was in conflict. He wanted a party that was in conflict with the Tories and with the establishment because he wanted to be elected into number 10 Downing Street. And that was the right decision. Right here and now, the decision has been made to oust the party of the left and that as a consequence of that, both the NEC and the head office are not good working environments. The NEC is extraordinarily difficult. Every time I go there, I tell myself that I'm not going to speak and then I end up having to speak because it's so outrageous what you hear. You feel that you have just no no alternative other than to voice what you know members would want you to voice if they had the opportunity to sit in your chair. So the fight is not over in respect of that, but it is a very, very difficult working environment. And Jamie's question about left unity is is a great question. The reality, of course, is left B right now has become a, an existential uh, war for the direction of the Labour Party. It has become about the soul of the Labour Party. Will the Labour Party be turned into something that is cultural, London-centric, uh, liberal with a, a small L, or will it be a pure party of socialism? Because it is the truth, it is policy that matters, and Labour Party has to be a party of socialism. But uh, the, the, the fight is obviously, um, is obviously one that is extraordinarily difficult. Jamie asks the question, what of left unity? Well, the meeting that I've just come from was pr- about precisely that. It was about a working group that has been set up with all of the interested left bodies within Labour to try and bring all of the organisations together in, to, to define socialism within Labour. As trade unions, as Unite, we are in conversations with the other six left unions to talk about coming together as well to talk about making a statement of labor for socialism and then bringing all of the other left bodies with us as soon as we make it very clear that this struggle that is going on in the labor party is not about people or personalities it's not about individuals who frankly come and go it is about the direction of labor labor's direction in 2017 was one that could very easily have won us power we'll know whether or not it was the internal wranglings that head office and the actions of others that prevented us from achieving a victory in 2017. But what many of us felt, including myself, was that the genie was out of the bottle. Young people now would never go away and that we were would have a socialist government the next time around. And that direction of travel has been changed. And that's why the left has to come together now to fight for socialism within Labour, to fight for the 2017 manifesto and to make it very clear that the right wing do not have an agenda. They do not have policies. They are becoming oppositionalists within our own party. Their only agenda seems to be to defeat the left. There is nothing that has been offered by way of policy. It is only the left that speaks for us. It's only the left that speaks for trade unionism and collectivism. And it's the only the left that will provide hope for young people as soon as they re-engage in politics. So we as a left have to unify. And if we do unify, then I believe that we can win back Labour and keep it on the direction of socialism. Right, thanks very much. You, you've partly covered the next question, but only partly. Yeah, uh, yeah. It's, from, it, it's from Sean Laws, uh, who actually works for a trade union, though he's actually a member himself of Unite. Uh, how do you see organisations like NEL and Unite working together more closely in future to engage members when clearly the Labour Party are losing members rapidly in order to defend the trade union rights that we have and moreover to fight for the rights that we deserve? Well, very simply through political education. Um, the I have the role as Assistant General Secretary for the political department and in much the same way as whenever I was, uh, had solely the legal department, it used to be an angst of mine that people used to think about the legal department as out with the industrial strategy of the union. 
when they needed to think of the legal department being part of the industrial strategy of the union, part of how you fight back. Uh, all of these, our departments need to stop working in silos and work together. And that's very much the agenda now for the political department, that it has to step forward and be part of everything that we're doing in the same way that the industrial uh, strategy needs to be part of what we're doing in the same way as our strategy in respect of education needs to be part of what we're doing, but all of it working together. So a very simple answer as to how we can work together is in that respect of our political education. It's all of our responsibilities now to go out and find the champions of our industry, the champions of our communities, the champions of our political arenas, and have them talk together on collectivism and trade unionism and the role that it plays within society. And by finding those champions, then once again, I believe that people will see the importance of trade unionism within society. And if trade unionism is seen as important, then I believe that it will be attractive to young people. And that ultimately is what will lead to change. Right, thanks very much. Now, Kath Davis asks the next question, and it's whether there is a hierarchy in society and the Labour Party regards racism, that allegations of anti-Semitism appear to be treated very, very differently from allegations of anti-Black, anti-Chinese or anti-Gypsy racism. Stuart, can I just, sorry to interrupt, um, I was wondering whether Jenny wanted to answer some of the earlier questions. More than happy, Jenny. Thanks. Okay, thanks. Yeah, I mean, I'm, oh, hang on. Am I, am I I'm muted now yet? Yeah? Great. Yeah, yeah. There's some... Um, I mean, there's not a lot I can add to what Howard said, and I completely believe, uh, sorry, agree with everything that he said um, in response to all the earlier questions as well, in particular the one about trade unions. Just very briefly on the on the, the stuff regarding the Labour Party, I mean, I think it was a huge mistake to suspend people simply for showing solidarity with Jeremy, um, and it's caused some real unnecessary division and um, hurt and anger amongst people, which I think is... Um, a really a, a real own goal from the from the Labour Party leadership at this at this time, and um, particularly after Keir did stand on a, a platform of unity and bringing everyone together. And I think suspending people uh, was a, a huge mistake. I completely agree with Howard about open selections. Um, we've seen what's happened recently with the Hartlepool selection and the Liverpool mayor. Um, and again, you know, closing down our democracy and simply saying, you know, we are going to dictate to you what happens is um, maybe it's designed to drive people away, but whether or not it is, it's not, um, it's, it's having the desired effect and it's not doing anything to, to create any kind of unity. Yet the left is still being blamed for any disunity there is when the left is attempting to work through the structures um, and campaign alongside people and just get on with things, um, which I think is extremely difficult. Um, so I'm not sure whether we're the right people to ask these, these questions too, because you know it's the, the the power is in the hands of the leadership. But as Howard quite rightly says, it's up to all of us to get far more active and to get more people active um, in CLPs and in trade unions and just not give up. Um, because you know the right is only in the ascendancy if we allow them to dominate um, in all the different parts of our organisations. And I think that's the that's the key thing. And it's it's how do we encourage and um, you know, bring along people to go to CLP meetings, to get involved, to get involved in their trade unions, to be part of the conversation and to really sort of push in all sorts of, of, of different ways. Um, Unite's political strategy is not just about support for the Labour Party, it's about working with other organisations outside the Labour Party that, that um, you know, support our own um, views and beliefs and, and, and things that we're, we're striving for, such as the People's Assembly and so on. And I think that's massively important. You only need to see the support as I said earlier on, that all of the, the protests about Kill the Bill have been getting you know, up and down the country and they've been absolutely fantastic. And it's about harnessing that energy. The one I went to, it was almost all young people. There were very few oldies like me. It was almost all young people at the Kill the Bill protest in Southampton, which is brilliant. But we need to kind of channel that energy into you know, really making a difference politically centrally um, so that you know, we, we have got a, a, a power and a force for good that is really going to make a difference because 
the idea that you know going back to the, the you know the late party days of, of Tory light and austerity light is somehow going to be attractive to anybody other than the you know the, the, the red tops and the Tory media is is just completely daft it turns people off completely I mean I, I dread to think what's going to happen in Hartlepool you guys up there are much closer to it than than we are and of course we desperately hope there's going to be a Labour win but it's not looking brilliant as, at the moment is it so I, I think we all need to galvanize ourselves to just kind of think right we're not going to be defeated by this and just carry on and be positive and keep hope all the time and just feed off each other's hope and feed off each other's enthusiasm and excitement about alternative ideas thanks very much which of you would like to answer kath's question about on racism Stuart, just before we do, just to, to, to endorse what Jenny say saying and just add a little bit to it, because I was at the Kill the Bill rally. I spoke at the Kill Bill, Bill rally in, in London on Saturday, and I was amazed by how many young, particularly young female and, and black activists were at the front of, of it, uh, ensuring that their voices were heard in society. And it gave me nothing but hope coming out of it. And I do I do wonder at times, especially whenever you, you visit a rally such as that, as to whether or not there's something that's about to be unleashed by way of activism as, through, as soon as we're through COVID, whether or not all of us will in fact be surprised about how much activism is pent up and how much people want to have their say in society and whether or not Kill the Bill is just touching the paper in respect of just lighting the paper in respect of what could happen going forward. And I very much hope it does. And I very much hope that the Labour leadership watches it and feels themselves uh, galvanised as a consequence of it, because I think... What Jenny's saying and what I would certainly be saying is that the criticism of Keir, of Keir Starmer right here and now is, is a hundredfold because of the fact that this country is in desperate need of opposition, desperate need of a leader who could show a different way through COVID and could speak for working class communities that have been so exposed through COVID. And instead, we have a Labour leader who thought that it was the opportunity uh, to declare war on the left in the hope that he could describe himself as a new leader, a new patriotic leader. And what, in fact, he did was fail to provide the leadership of opposition that was needed in a moment of crisis. And I think that is, at the moment, what marks this leadership and why I certainly have been so critical of it. Sure, to deal with the question of a hierarchy of racism, first of all, obviously, everybody would agree on this soon that there should be no hierarchy of racism. All racism within society is disgraceful and uh, disgusting but I think there is uh, a truth in respect of racism I certainly feel that I lead for the union with show racism the red card and I certainly feel that anti-black racism is more prevalent in society now than it has been for a number of years and I always feel when talking about racism I was brought up in a sectarian society and uh, and I always felt that you should describe sectarianism as racism I'm not so sure that you should any longer because anti-black racism is so prevalent, because there is no disguising the fact that someone is black. And as a consequence of that, it is so easy for society to suddenly generate that, that type of anti-black racism. And for me, that is extraordinarily dangerous. And obviously, we all know the anti-Semitism issues that the Labour Party has faced. We all know what came out from the, from the HRC report, and we all know uh, the decisions that uh, the Labour Party leadership has taken at this present moment in time uh, to, in their words, address the anti-Semitism issue. I've been very vocal to say that what Jeremy said at the time uh, of that report was not only permitted by that report, but entirely understandable, entirely understandable that a man who has fought racism all his life, but has had to be labelled with every single act of racism by, uh, by the members of the Labour Party, by right-wing media, should want to come out and say what he felt during his time as leadership for a number of reasons. And obviously the most important of reasons is if you do not talk of the scale of racism that exists, then how can you possibly ever attack uh, tackle racism? It's only by being open and honest and transparent about the scale of racism within any organization that you can then do what is needed to tackle that racism, but also because Jeremy had a responsibility, he had a responsibility to himself and to the wider population to say that the Labour Party is not a party full of 200 anti-Semites. It is not a party that is ravaged with an army of people that want to go out 
and uh, and perpetrate anti-Semitic acts or narrative. It is a party of people who fundamentally want to fight racism in society. And the sooner we get back to that, uh, the better. The sooner that Labour is seen again as an anti-racist party, the better. But the message should be clear to everybody that Labour has a job of work now to, to do with our black communities to make sure that it is seen as an anti-black racist party, because there can be no doubt that the response to Black Lives Matters was far too slow. The language that was used was poor. There can be no doubt that even a debate about abstentionism over the police crime and sentencing bill was wrong because the police crime and sentencing bill is fundamentally racist. I don't think there can ever have been a piece of legislation that more encapsulates the phrase institutionalized racist than the police sentencing and crime bill. The idea that statues of racists are protected in this country by a 10 year jail sentence for anybody that vandalizes them and that that piece of legislation is prescribed by the highest legislative body in our lands is nothing more than institutionalized racism. And Labour needs to get back talking about that. It needs to convince black communities that they do see anti-black racism in the same light as other racisms. And they need to start speaking again for, uh, for those black communities. Right, thanks very much. By the way, Jenny, I think Jenny's coming to, in there. If you want to say anything. I just want to add, I'm not, I'm not going to say anything more about the, the issues that, that um, Howe's been talking about, but I also think that it's really important, it's been highlighted over the last week or so, just how prevalent is anti-Gypsy and traveller um, racism, um, mm. not just in the Green Party, but also in the Labour Party. And when I was General Secretary, I did get to um, bring together representatives from the um, Gypsy, traveller and Romani communities to talk about just how appallingly badly many Labour councils treat um, the traveller communities, which is, you know, shocking. It's really shocking, and the the services and the discrimination that they um, that they suffer all the time. Um, some are refused access to, you know, to education, to to doctors, and so on. There are people who won't go on to properly established official sites because they say it's dangerous when, when it isn't. I mean, stereotypes are dreadful. And the key to all of this, Howard talked earlier on um, about his fantastic history with Show Races in the Red Card. As long as I've, I've been around, Howard's been part of Show Races in the Red Card. That is, the work that they do is very much based on education. And I think it's vitally important that the Labour Party really, first of all, educates itself throughout every, every level of a party, at every, you know, in, in, in every, every part of the community and with every elected official on all elements of racism. Um, and, you know, in, in that way, only once it really sort of truly understands the hurt and the pain that they cause to people. And we've seen so many, as I said earlier on, so many members from black communities who've just left the Labour Party because they feel it's not for them. They've been frustrated that the, um, uh, oh God, how can I possibly have forgotten the name of the report? The report. The Ford report. How can I forget that, good grief. Anyway, the, the, the Ford report, is, you know, isn't, doesn't, doesn't appear ever to, to be going to be published. And, um, you know, we, we haven't seen the, the results of that, unfortunately. And I think it would be very cathartic if, if we could see that and see the outcome of that. But, you know, people really need to feel that it's a party for them. And it's not just a party of, of people who say, well, we're going to come and, you know, do the right thing for all of you in a very patronising, paternalistic way at best. Um, and at worst, be very exclusive and um, and discriminate directly against people. I think it's massively important. And it, it, I, I'm going to add to that, Stuart, because it mm -hmm. is vitally important that we do talk for the traveller and Romani and Gypsy communities. And the, the legislation, no one should ever look at legislation in isolation. Think of legislation always, please, next to the other legislation, because that's the jigsaw that is then painted by a party as to what society they want to create. And that there's... A, that this legislation, this police crime and sentencing legislation for the travelling community means that absence a travelling licence, you, you run the risk of your vehicles being seized. And that is a real, real attack on the, on the very existence of travellers. And, you know, look then at, you know, unfortunately, we should all reference it, Charlotte Nichols uh, leaflets that she was distributing. I don't know if she put them together, but she was certainly distributing them and pictured with it where it talks about dealing with 
traveller incursions. You know, that is language that is racist language and has no place in the Labour Party. And we need to see action taken in regard to language such as that as quickly as we see actions taken in respect of anti-Semitism. Right. We, we are starting to run out of time. The next question might be longer than your answer. It's from Dr. Alex Scottman Samuel. Labour's 2017 conference unanimously supported my motion to fully renationalise the NHS in England. However, the Shadow Health team has failed to actively oppose what are now called integrated care systems. It's also failed to oppose the NHS England long-term plan, which is dismantling and Americanizing England's NHS. Can you confirm that a Beckett-led Unite would support conference policy on the NHS, actively oppose integrated care systems and the long-term plan and support the NHS reinstatement bill? Yes, um, I, I can go slightly further than that, just to say that, you know, I, I've been working very closely with Deborah Harrington, which I'm sure uh, the, uh, the individual who put the question, I'm sorry, I've, I've forgotten the name. I'm sure that you're aware of, of Deborah Harrington and all of our work. I, I've been working very closely with Deborah about getting her in front of our NISC, making sure that people understand that it isn't just the Tories who are privatising, that Blair was privatising the NHS as well. It's not just stopping, but it is also reversing that we need to do. Unfortunately, the model for the NHS is now premised on less care equals more profit, and that's what they intend to drive forward, is less care equals more profit. And that's the reason for the narrative around super hospitals, because ultimately that means less care in our community. So very much committed to it and uh, it's work in progress right here and now. And for, or for anybody who's following uh, Unite Unity Left, you will see that a big focus of what we're doing with Unite Unity Left is trying to talk for the NHS sector, uh, particularly coming out of COVID, but because no one, no one union owns the narrative in respect of the NHS. This is about uh, the NHS's socialism. Right. Uh... Can, can, can I say, um, we have uh, five questions left. Uh, I'll tell you what the subjects are because I don't think we're going to be able to properly answer them and it wouldn't be fair given the seriousness that have been asked. But there might be some final comment that Jenny uh, or Howard might want to make. Um, Paul Peacock asks about free ports. Trish Williams, second bite of the apple, asks about proportional representation. Theresa Cairns asks about universal basic income. Barry Gills asks about Myanmar um, and the sanctions that should be applied there. And Diane Jones, I think, asks about trans women's rights, uh, trans rights and women's rights. The five huge areas, all of which would deserve a meeting on their own. Um, and you've got, I think, altogether, to the two of you combined, four minutes if you want to make any reference to any of those subject areas or anything else that you'd like to say in your closing remarks. Jenny, do you want to go first? I'm just going to suggest perhaps that you take on the free ports because it's such an important issue for, for the North and the North East. And I know it's something that you've been looking at very carefully. Well, yes, I am. And it's, it's a, you know, I, always, I know Paul well. He's a, he's a great rep and free ports are a massive concern of mine. I think the free ports are almost the end game as far as the Brexit deal is concerned for the Tory party. It's the opportunity to create these tariff free zones, but in doing so and making them attractive because people will want to keep their jobs who will want their industries in these tariff free zones as so as tariffs do not see the loss of jobs in doing so it then becomes deregulated and we have all these questions about how it's going to be governed so the thing i would say and, and again jamie is on on the uh, on the call is that free ports for me are about pitting sector against sector and region against region and what labor has to do and what the trade unions have to do is we have to outline our standards and the very first standard 
record in respect of free ports is that we will not accept them if there are no guarantees in respect of governance and access of trade unions to make sure that they do not become deregulated zones. Otherwise, all that will happen is there will be a transfer of industry from outside free ports into free ports. There will then be tax havens, tariff-free zones, but deregulated, and it will mean that working people will pay for it with their terms and conditions, and health and safety provisions will be driven down in exchange for profit being driven up for very few. In reference to the question on proportional representation, I support proportional representation. I think most people know that. I think that part of the reason as to why we have the Labour Party we have is that it's forgotten that it needs to talk for communities and proportional representation, in my view, would be part of the answer of making sure that the Labour Party once again reflects the communities that it talks for. I also believe in it because it's democratically fair and ultimately democracy is about winning the argument, not pitching uh, the, the playing field in your favour. Jenny, I don't know if you want to deal with the others. Um, well, I just want to say something, I, mean, I know we've got like two minutes now, so I just want to say something really quickly about the about UBI. I think UBI is definitely something that we should be exploring um, in a lot more detail, but also really importantly in something which we've eventually got as Labour Party policy, um, and who knows whether that's going to remain Labour Party policy, is sectoral collective bargaining, because only through sectoral collective bargaining, um, which is nothing new, we had it when I was young, many, many years ago, we had wages councils and, and, and JRCs and so on. Um, only in that way can we really make sure that we drive up wages and, um, and that we have, uh, you know, an end to the, to the race to the bottom in particular sectors where, you know, the only way that in, employers and in particular subcontractors compete with each other is by driving down terms conditions. Um, and, you know, sectoral collective bargaining with trade union rights, right at the heart of that um, is extremely important. So we need to look at these really important issues, UBI, sectoral collective bargaining and all of the other things that you've got on there, I think, in much more detail. Yeah, I agree completely, uh, Jenny, that UBI, obviously, we should be supportive of UBI and we should be supportive of the of more benefits at this moment in time for the most vulnerable in society. But let's not uh, move away from the argument that we are, we're owed much more in society than simply benefits. Society has to work for us. There is money in society at this moment in time. We've seen it through COVID that there is money in society. And I suspect the Tories have realized that there is such thing as a money tree, but they just want to plant that and take all the money for themselves. And our fight has to be about avoiding in-work poverty and making sure that this is about driving up long-term uh, ambitions of working class people to ensure that our role in society is reflected. So UBI, yes, but it's part of the answer. It goes hand in glove with what Jenny's talking about, sectoral bargaining and proper rights for people within the workplace and trade union representation. That's what ultimately will drive up working class conditions, just in the other two, not to avoid them. Uh, sure, we need obviously to have a policy that is about, uh, is, it reflects our our socialist principles around the world and the idea that we would be supplying arms to countries that are involved in war against their own peoples or war against other countries that is uh, that is seeing the deaths of, of uh, children and uh, and others is, is just unconscionable and uh, it, that doesn't in any way mean that we don't support sectors that where, where workers need good terms and conditions. We do support uh, the right of people's jobs but we uh, those sectors themselves would not want to see uh, what they produce exported to regimes that are going to use it in respect of uh, actions of war against uh, against their own populations or against uh, children and in respect of trans and women's rights. So what I would say very briefly on that is that we need to make space for the debate in regard to it. I, I, I would caution people about no platforming and uh, and things such as that in respect of these arguments. This this is a very difficult issue. It's probably diff more difficult for me as a male to talk about. We need to make the space for trans and women to be able to talk about the issues and to be able to find a resolution as so as it does not become an issue that divides the left. Well, thanks very much. We're, we've reached the uh, end of the meeting. Um, 
this is this is where I say thanks, and there's a huge round of applause for our speakers. But because we in Zoom, we, because we in Zoom, it's not quite like that. What it certainly made me look forward to the removal of lockdowns, so that you can actually see everybody in front of you without having to go through different screens and having three different sets of eyes just to be able to see what's happening. So uh, the only other thing, uh, because. NEL itself uh, is a supremely democratic body, we will be having a meeting of our UNITE members uh, fairly shortly, and they will consider the general secretary elections and all of the candidates uh, that appear to be uh, putting their names forward. Um, so uh, I, I promised Jenny in particular that the meeting would finish at eight because the both of them have got so many other things to do and to be, be, be there. So uh, it's only over to Ian. Can you sh close the meeting technically because I haven't got a clue technically. I certainly can, Stuart, and uh, thanks to Stuart for doing a good job as chair. Absolutely. Good night, everybody. Bye -bye. Good night, everybody. Bye -bye. Solidarity. Bye.